Good morning. Okay, so you are still alive, and at least some of you are not asleep. I know uh, you, you were taken from your classrooms where you were supposed to study things to get a job, and instead of this, they told you to come here and, and what? Yeah, yeah, this is a serious thing because the majority of you came to university with only one thought. Get a job. The best would be probably in the services, in Noida. By the way, living in Noida is not fun. When there is a, a torrential rain, the whole Noida has no Wi Fi. And how can you live without Wi Fi? You, you see, I am old enough to know that it's possible to live without cell phone and Wi-Fi. But for you, it may be a very scary thought, you know. I think that the majority of you, when, when you were confronted with the thought, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, there will be no Facebook, because there will be no internet. You probably it's worse than seeing a horror movie, something like Friday the 13th. More scary, yes? I know. So, you came here to get a job, but, ladies and gentlemen, let me put this to you. Getting a job is not everything. Getting a job is just temporary commitment to be associated with some idiot who will be telling you what to do. I'm glad that you share my feelings. Yeah. If you are told to come every day at 9, and at 9 or 3, they will take money from your salary. Yeah. And then you're supposed to stay till your boss is staying, the Japanese way. You know, in Japan, even if you have nothing to do, if your boss, if your leader of your group is still working at 7 p.m., you cannot leave. Because if you leave, this would be offensive to your boss who is working. So you are waiting till 7.30 to go with your boss, drink a lot of sake and get drunk. And then you wander around pizza area aimlessly trying to figure out who you are and where is your home. I have seen this last week because last week we were uh, with President Gantra, we were in Tokyo for a week and we have seen plenty of those, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So guys, life is not about a job. Yeah, I know this may be sort of strange to hear this, but life is not about a job. Life is about thinking, about expanding your mind, about gaining knowledge. And it doesn't have, by the way, to be yet another version of Unity Engine that you're going to be studying. Yeah, I know, studying Unity Engine and developing characters that will be moving and will be killing other characters. It's cool. Uh, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I have never done it, but I appreciate this. But knowledge is important. So the fact that you are here, you can treat as a punishment or as an opportunity. An opportunity may be to open your mind, to see things differently, to get some perspectives on things which are happening around you, maybe this will change your vision of the world. And remember, it's going to be you guys who will be shaping the world which is coming. And what is coming is not nice. No. Your parents when they were your age, had this beautiful future in front of them because everything was getting better. 
Let me put it this way. Right now, everything is going straight to hell in a handbasket. This is the world around you. With the climate changes which are coming, with the conflicts, with the lack of water, we are coming to tough times. And it's going to be you guys who will be facing it. So the more knowledge you have, the more reflection you have, the better you can use your brains on your own without being told what to think, the better you will be and the better chance you have to survive in the world which is coming. So maybe instead of falling asleep or firing up another application on your cell phone to play some games, listen to what's going to be told and reflect on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That indeed was insightful, and I'm sure each one of our budding researchers and young workers agree to that completely. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. With no further ado, I now request Professor Navinraj Gupta, Pro Vice Chancellor, lovely professor university, to address the audience. Before we go ahead, let me throw a quick light on the credentials. A leading light in the field of technical and higher education in the country, his research-focused approach and an insightful, innovative intervention of technology in education has won him many accolades and laurels. He holds a PhD in bioinformatics and did his MTech in computer-aided design, interactive graphics from IIT Kanpur, and BE mechanical engineering from MIT Escola. Having a flair for endless learning, he has done more than 50 certifications and specializations online on IoT, augmented reality, gamification, machine learning from University of California, Watson School, University of Venezuela, Deep Learning, AI Google, Machine Learning Group. His research interests are in the areas of robotics, metatronics, bioinfographics, IoT, AI, ML, just to get started. He has seven books on IoT, mobile robotics platforms, biomedical sensors, and machine learning with data analytics. With 150 plus patents, 100 plus other publications, four granted copyrights, he is an epitome of knowledge and wisdom. I now request the man of excellence, Dr. Laviraj Gupta, to please grace us on the stage. Good morning, all. Why all the time you want me to repeat that again that I didn't hear that? Good morning. First of all, a great round of applause for the vibrance and energy of Dr. March. Believe me, all the people who were sleeping, he might have awakened them and brought them to this room mentally and physically both together. Isn't that true? Yes. So one yes. more applause for him. I didn't ask you to scream. Did I ask you to scream? Don't go out of the loop, please. He talked about two basic things. He talked about Friday the 13th as a scary movie. Back in 1993, 1994, there was a virus called Friday the 13th. And you know, all those x86 systems, 286, 386, 486 kind of systems, they are all infected by that virus. In, if, and if Friday occurs on any of the 13th of the month, the entire day, the PC would not boot up. And you know what people did? That if the Friday the 13th is happening tomorrow, they will change the date of the PC. Why I'm talking about this? That the technology has changed drastically because the shape of viruses, the shape of malwares, 
are now completely beyond comprehension of anybody. But that lends you into grandest of the opportunities. That makes you, I use this word, forget about being unicorns. You all are my sunicorns. Because soon you'll become a unicorn one day. I'm pretty sure. But three things. I've got three point agenda. Are you all ready with me? The very first point is, the very first point in the agenda of anybody studying computer science. Do not be syntax smart. Be logic smart. I developed the same codes using Fortran 4, Fortran 7, DBase 3, Foxbase, and I still code using Python and Go language. I do not believe in becoming syntax smart because languages will come, languages will go. You know how to implement an if statement or where to implement a while and not using do while at that point of time. If you know that, forget about what kind of languages may come and go. You'll always be the front runner in developing logics. The second very important thing is you need to unlearn and relearn every day. Go get yourself registered and subscribe to newsletters. You are lucky. For us, during our days of IIT Kanpur, if we needed an information, we used to wait for two weeks for the information. But now, your entire mobile is information indented. Go and subscribe to newsletters and read something what is happening. Very latest. To my utmost surprise, today in the morning, when I was going through a newsletter, Medium Digest, they told me that there is a brand new library which has come up with Python and it is named as Ice Cream. And that ice cream, go and read about ice cream. It really comes in handy for anyone who's debugging his own code. Marvels. Be logic smart. Be in the mode of unlearn and relearn. And keep yourself abreast. Because by the time I'm talking to you, technology is changing outside there. We need to be that akin to the lightning pace. And third and the most important thing, which would make you sunicorns. All of you have heard about Darwin's theory? Yes or no? The Darwin's theory is the theory of existence. Darwin talked about that you need to struggle to exist. But I redefine, refurbish and retune that theory because in today's context, the theory would be not of existence. The theory would be of coexistence. You need to collaborate. You need to cooperate. And you need to co-create knowledge. Being into computer science, nobody stops you to explore hotel management or culinary arts, wherein, wherein you can take your logics there. Nobody stops you to barge into agriculture, to go into genetics and genetic engineering, which I did in those good olden days of 2003, 2004. And I took my logic to genetics. I am pretty sure that these kind of conferences, which I must appreciate, give a good round of applause for team Dr. Rajiv Sophie, Dr. Chiddan, and all the HODs and HOSs, all the faculty members who have conceived this and have successfully planned the sixth edition of international conference. More importantly, to end my note, my outro, outro is a conclusive statement. People say that the world is being run, the world will run, and the future of this entire humanity and the globe earth is on the word called IOT. All of you know about IOT? Okay, somebody said no. IOT is Internet of Things. I do agree, but I have my own version to it. Yes, the world is being run by IOT, 
it will be run by iot and the future of humanity belongs to iot and my definition of iot is indians of tomorrow and that is what you are i wish you all the very best and listen to each and every word because then only we'll be able to game change the entire scenario of computing and taking this world to the next level wish you all the very best good luck and god speed thank you so much sir i must say to be the front learners the way you've told us to unlearn to make sure that we coexist to collaborate and the new definition that you've given all of us for the indians of tomorrow that indeed was an enthralling speech thank you so much sir i request all of us to please give him a huge round of applause the gratitude the love the reference the honor are small words that we all have in our minds today with the presence of each one of these esteemed dignitaries here who are here to enlighten us with their knowledge and wisdom to express this we are short of words but we're not short of our expression for the same i request dr naviraj gupta pro vice chancellor nagpur professional university to come forward and felicitate our guest of honor professor marsin Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge round of applause to express our gratitude for the presence. We are indeed honoured to have Sir amongst us today. University. I now request the Pro Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, I'm sorry, Dr. Naviraj Gupta, to please honor Professor Maria Ganza for joining us here for Booth Hundred. Ma'am, it's indeed an honor and privilege to have you amongst us and to host you at this international conference on computing sciences. Thank you so much for your presence, ma'am. Give them a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I request, sir, to once again please honour Miss Richard Jain Gupta for her presence. We look forward to your words of wisdom. And your experience here at the university, ma'am. It is indeed the way sir said collaboration coexistence. Once we have the leaders of industry here in academia with us, thank you so much for joining us here, ma'am. I humbly request sir to please honour Dr. Kamal Nath Samrakul and express our heartfelt gratitude for his presence here. Thank you so much sir. It's indeed an honor to have such distinguished amenities amongst us. But in order to thank each one of them, I would request the cos school of computer science engineering dr pradeep agarwal the convener of ice double cs 2022 to please come forward and express his gratitude over to you sir good morning everyone good morning sir good morning everyone good morning sir ha ah, thank you so it's my privilege to have been Asked to propose a vote of thanks uh, on this uh, wonderful occasion of Booth Hundred Conference. Uh, so, I, on behalf of Booth Hundred ICCS Conference and the entire fraternity of computer science and engineering here together, and also on my own behalf, I extend my 
very hearty thank vote of thanks to honorable chancellor sir vardeep pro chancellor ma'am for always encouraging us to conduct such kind of mega events and research uh, activities i i also thankful to all the speakers for their gracious presence and sharing their wonderful insightful information with our students and us so a big thank you to professor marsen uh, papris ki uh, for his sharing his uh, insightful wisdom on the meaning of life and vision like life is not just to get the job but also it is to gain the knowledge and uh, set the visions so i also uh, uh give my express my uh, thanks to professor maria genza for being over here and uh, uh, uh and uh, express uh, her uh, presence over here among our students uh, i also uh, convey my grateful i am grateful to ms richardian gupta our uh, dr kamal nath samarakun from university of peridinia who expressed uh, his uh, wonderful knowledge with our faculty members students yesterday and not only uh, he shared his uh, wisdom but also he uh, actually uh, contributed and collaborated a lot in this conference so for this i am thankful to dr kamal nath i also wish my uh, wish to express my gratitude to uh, dr shriram k vasudevan professor richard hill and rupert ward who will be delivering the virtual talk with our students and researchers and with this uh, finally i would like to thank this opportunity to place on record our hearty thank to our pro vardi pro chancellor sir uh, pro vice chancellor sir dr laviraj gupta for his continuous guidance and throughout uh, this event and his blessings i am also thankful to professor rajiv sopti he is our senior dean and uh, head of school computer science engineering for his perfect logistic support and guidance throughout this booth 100 uh, i am also uh, extending my warm thanks to all the cuss hods and my colleagues for their enormous cooperation in the organization of this event so well friends an event like this cannot happen overnight it requires lots of efforts and uh tremendous exercises and planning so we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of computer science engineering school and who know their job and result oriented so last but not the least i would convey my sincere thanks thanks to all the researchers scholars students and academicians who contributed their work in this conference and make made this event a grand success so with all these closing remarks i conclude my words by thanking everyone who directly or indirectly involved to make this uh, booth 100 a grand success thank you thank you sir indeed that was a true expression of our gratitude on behalf of all of us to our esteemed guest with that i request all the dignitaries to please join us on the sofas ahead to be comfortable and join us for hearing the keynote speakers one by one i request professor marcel the man who serves the chair of i triple e poland section of computer science chapter the man who has contributed with 500 plus publications and been to 500 plus international conferences to come forward and propose this keynote address may request for your presence sir sure may request each one of us to please make sure you give him a huge round of applause to welcome him Okay. I want to see my presentation. It's right here. Okay. Which one is? Which one is? They're okay. all working. They're all working. 
Okay, you, you can see the title of my presentation. It was here a moment ago. Uh, yeah, the, the title of the presentation will be In Search of Perfect Paneer. Well, uh, I am a foreigner, so I came and I fell in love with Paneer. But there are probably 100,000 different ways of preparing a paneer. So I figured out I need to find the best one. And each time I'm in some place, I am asking the local, what is your best paneer? And they serve me something, and I will tell you. At this moment, number one paneer comes from a restaurant in Missouri. Have you, who has been to Missouri? Okay, there is a restaurant which is named Urban Turban there. Uh, the photo in the middle is from that restaurant and the table there is the one that we were sitting with Professor Maria and had the best paneer ever. And if you go to uh, TripAdvisor, there is even a photograph of a paneer like this. Oh my God, this was delicious. Of course, this was after a walk through Missouri, so maybe um, this was cheating because if you're hungry, anything will taste good uh, other than Japanese natto beans, which is, uh, anybody tried natto beans in, like from Japan? Ugh. <laughs> Anybody has been to Korea and tried fermented crab? Yeah. So generally, I, I, there are two foods that I know that I will never taste again because I am not appreciating them, natto beans and Korean fermented crabs, okay? So now, um, I think I have control over this thing. Let's see if it's gonna work. Um, <laughs> now, seriously. Uh, seriously, I wanted to share with you something. By the way, can you hear it, see it? And, and it looks good? Okay. So, guys, I, I wanted to share... Ah, I have it here too, okay. It's all, con it's all confusing. Um, okay. So, um, I wanted to share with you some knowledge about so-called federated learning. Feder yeah, they are taking away the chairs, so we will not come back there, okay? Um, maybe it's a sign that we should leave. No. Uh, so, I will be talking to you about federated learning. Uh, the aim of this talk is to... Um, familiarize you with the concept of federated learning and then um, tell you what is needed in federated learning to make it practical. And here we have an extremely skillful, knowledgeable professional from the practical side, from business. And uh, during lunch I will be very curious to hear from her um, her thoughts about practical aspects of federated learning. Um, okay, so let's start from something that you may know or may easily envision. Uh, let's talk about machine learning. I presume that all of you in some way or another saw machine learning. One of the problems of machine learning is uh, that in a variety of cases, before you get your results, it takes hours, days, it may even take a week to train a model. So already for a long time, researchers are studying methods, how you can split the work. So you combine the task, the computational task, and then somehow have each independent machine or node in a cluster 
or node in a parallel computer compute its own job and then somehow to combine the results. So it's standard divide and conquer type approach, which means you split, give it to independent nodes, independent machines, then you combine the results. Now, what can happen is that either you do all the work and then combine the results at the end, which is rare, but it can also happen that you combine the results, then split the job again, do some calculations, combine the results, split the job, combine the results, split the job, combine the results, split the job, and then someplace there is stopping criteria. And by the way, at this moment, it doesn't matter which specific machine learning task it is. It doesn't matter what stopping criteria it is. What matters is that you can split those things and you can combine them, which means that you hope that your answer will come faster. Okay? General idea. Now, um, one of the early versions of distributed problem solving what comes from the time when the majority of you were just an idea in heads of your parents. Because if you count it, it's 2000, so 23 years ago. Or maybe you were a scary moment of thoughts of your, par of your parents. Oh, God, we're going to have a child. Yeah, I know something about it. So anyways, a scary moment. We're going to have a child, but you are not here yet, but Eric Cantupas, who worked as on his uh, doctorate, because this result is from a PhD research, um, did something like this. Uh, genetic algorithms, uh, he split the population between nodes of a parallel computer at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And then each node was calculating new populations of this genetic process. And from time to time, best results have been exchanged. This is how he was splitting the work and combining the work. Combining was through exchanging singular genomes, best genomes. Later on, this process became known as island version of genetic algorithm or genetic approach. Island version because the assumption was that each island is having its own population, and then the best genomes that are exchanged are like sailors who go to another island and multiply there. And I'm not commenting on this one, okay? Uh, by the way, I, I just wanted to suggest that the battery here is running low on this machine, so maybe uh, something needs to be done. There is some place power which is missing. Can somebody fix it? Okay. Okay. I, I hope that I'm not running from the... I, I think I'm running from this machine, so we're going to run off electricity soon. So then I will do hand puppets. Okay. So, uh, distributed machine learning, yes, oh, yeah, th this guy is going to fix the problem. He is, he, he is the, the fixer. Yeah, electricity is not coming from wherever it's coming. And it's not... Yeah? Uh, but he Huh? Okay, apparently it's fixed. Switch chain. No, it's not fixed. Uh, okay, so um, distributed machine learning is well studied. I mean, look, 22 years ago it was all already studied. Uh, there is some work which is on how um, this can be done, and there is this thing coming from um, archive. And by the way, um, I will send, well, those slides are available, so anybody who's interested can get them from Professor Gauri Matur or uh, from Professor Garg, so you can get those slides. I, I'm ready to share them. Uh, it is also, 
Uh, it is also uh, part of parallel computing, which is splitting the job and running independently on parts of the machine. Okay, so we have this. We can do this. But those methods that people study for a long time are based on one assumption. And the assumption is simple. The owner of the data has full control of what's going on. So there is one owner of the data, one facilitator, and this facilitator will run machine learning. So we'll send jobs to different nodes that it owns, has full control over, and then we'll collect the results. Super. Except that this is not the world of today. For instance, uh, all of you have smartphones. Each smartphone has 10 or more sensors. And those sensors are generating data. Now, this is fine, but the fact that you have this data, that you own this data, doesn't give you much. Because if you try to train something only on the data from your smartphone, you will not get good models. It's going to be useless in general. So now, the question is, can we do something about it? Hmm. Uh, and it should be working. Should Just be. trying it. Yeah, it's working. Okay, I got the device. Okay, we will try to work with the device. Okay, um, so if you have hundred dollars, you can get yourself a air quality sensor. Because I just checked last night and on Amazon, and it is specifically mentioned ships to India, you can get a weather station with quality of air control. It's a box, looks like this, more or less large, for $100. Now think about this, I mean, you are engineers. Each and every one of you, $100 is not, a, not much. I know because I know how many of you have apples. If you have Apple phone, you can afford a quality of air sensor. Uh, or you can ask your parents. Okay, um, guys, if you install this thing outside of your window, think with me, you have stream of data about air quality. But for all practical purposes, it's gonna be useless. Because you have stream of data in one location. It's your data. You can try to use some machine learning to train something on it. But guys, if you have, let's say outside of your window in your dormitory, you have one point where you're gonna measure things. Not much. Whereas, if each and every one of you had a sensor like this, and you lived around town, around the area, then somehow, we could deliver something interesting. There is also machine learning dedicated hardware, little things that are available, and those little things are... In, Intel Movidius, I think, is dead by now, but Intel was trying to do those little machine learning things which look like a pen drive. But there is NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which is also not very expensive, it's a small board. So everybody could put anywhere machine learning. But this machine learning is local. It will have limited capacity of reasoning. This means that we need something different. We need to be able to deal with a situation when there is more than one owner of data. Now, what happens here? Um, you have multiple devices with multiple owners that have data which is important, 
but you need to get them together to get something valuable. Then there are the other sides. Let's say that you have plenty of images on various machines. You know, or you should know, that machine learning task is better if you have a lot of images. Let's say you're going to study something, some classification based on images. Well, if you combine them, you can get good quality machine learning model. But guys, how you combine them if they belong to different people and also sending them across the network may be a problem. Your network may be weak sometimes, all the time. How you combine them? Sometimes local images cannot leave the location. You cannot send them to the cloud. In India, you have hundreds of thousands of clinics. Each clinic has its own medical data. Most likely, this data is protected, privacy protected. You cannot send this data to the central cloud to do machine learning. This data has to stay where it, where it lives. And also, different data can belong to different stakeholders. What it means is, let's say that you have multiple companies that use specific machine or similar machines. Well, they don't want to share the data about their machines. But if they use only machine learning on their one or two machines, this will not give you good models. We need to share without sharing. So a key point here is, okay, the first key point, wake up, look at me, hey. First key point is, distributed machine learning is relatively easy because all the data belongs to one owner. But if the data does not belong to one owner, we need to share without sharing. Okay, this is the problem. How to share without sharing? This is what federated learning is about. Federated learning, and now focus, guys, stop talking to your friends. Yes, I know this girl is beautiful, but at this moment, look at me, I am not beautiful, but at least uh, you will get some knowledge and not get in trouble. Okay, uh, so federated learning. Federated learning is a, an approach to train jointly a model without sharing the data. So this is where this sharing without sharing comes. You will get joint model, but without sending data to the central cloud, without sharing any data. How does it work? Okay, so here we have it. You have nodes, and each node will be training model on local data. And then they will exchange ideas how the model should be improved. So let's say that here we have around, apparently around 2,000 students. So if there is around 2,000 students, each one of you will train your own model and then make suggestion how to improve the joint model. I will take all of your suggestions together, average them, and use this to generate round two of the model. So from the initial, not knowing nothing, I get your inputs, all of you. You give me input, I produce new model, and I send it back to you. And then you train it again on your local data, Send me suggestions for updates. I average them, improve the model, and send it back to you. And I repeat it round after round after round until there is a stopping criteria. The model stops improving. And now, look what happened. We all contributed to creation of one model. Okay? There is one model, but none of you release any knowledge of your data. Your data remains private, but 
there is joint model, sharing without sharing. Why do we do this? Well, uh, single owner of data, as I told you, may not be enough. So it may be not enough to have data from one source only. Model will not be good enough. And then there is this thing that we talked about during uh, the initial talks about collaboration. And your chancellor was talking about collaboration as being important. Now we have in business the new business model, which is named co-opetition. What is co-opetition? It means that you are competing while collaborating. There are some areas where you are collaborating, but you are competing in another. I mean, think about this. We are really starting to talk. Let's say that there is this machine that is used by various um, tractor factories around across India. And we want to do predictive maintenance. Do you know what is predictive maintenance? You don't? Okay, this is what you do. You put sensors on your machine and you let those sensors report the behavior of the machine. And then you use time series analysis and you learn that if there is certain pattern of data, then potentially something wrong can happen to your machine. Okay? It's doable. And this is important. This is important because instead of having machine which is broken, you can sort of like, you know, oh, mm, this machine doesn't sound well. Let's graciously stop it, send engineers to check it, do some maintenance, predictive maintenance. So I predict that something may go wrong and I improve the machine, replace some parts, put some oil, whatever, and then I restart it. This is cheap. If the machine breaks during production, it's a disaster. So, what if I wanted all those companies that produce tractors to compete in, in the tractors? Some like Massey Ferguson, some they, some they don't like Massey Ferguson. But all of them use Siemens machines to produce them. If they exchange the data and create better model for prediction, for the predictive maintenance, if they do this, then all of them are better off while still competing. There is no problem. They will be fully competing on the market. Who has a better tractor? Uh, which way of marketing is better? It's okay. But for the goodness of the society, reduction of number of break-ins during production is good. So you have competition. And of course, you have also the data requirements like the GDPR, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is the European rule, general data protection regulation. And this is for privacy protection. So you cannot share certain data. It cannot leave certain locations because it's privacy. Very important concept in Europe. I want, th there is this thing here, uh, which is very popular, which is um, areas of interest and taxonomy of federated learning. But we are running short a little bit on time. So I'm just gonna focus on two aspects of federated learning. Scale, or one aspect, scale of federation. I'm not sure if you know, but majority, if you have um, Android phones, your Android phones may be participating in federated learning for Google. Because what they do is they send a little model. Your phone will be using your local data to uptrain it and may send a proposed update back to Google. This is what's happening. Now, this is interesting because it's typically one bunch of training is around 5,000 devices, um, most likely around 5% of them will never return the data in time, but they are building, for instance, word prediction. You know, when you are writing on a phone, 
and the phone may suggest to you the next word, how this is done. Well, it is federated learning by Google, among other things, that suggests what is the next word based on all of you, okay? By the way, those phones participate maybe once, maybe twice in a lifetime, and they are totally not recognizable. But we can have also a business scenario. A business scenario in which businesses agree to participate in federated learning. And then we have limited number of nodes, not 2,000, maybe two, three, four, five, maybe 100, but this is the max. And they will be cooperating in developing this model. Now, um, here, for instance, um, the, everything goes al along with some agreements. So we are not talking about, you know, you're being surprised that your phone participates in machine learning. This is about an agreement between businesses that they will be jointly developing things. And by the way, there is, for instance, an agreement between 10 largest pharmaceutical companies in the world that they will be building joint models to develop new uh, medicines. They will be actually pharmaceuticals will be collaborating while competing. Now, where is the research? Now, for those of you who may think about, hey, this sounds cool for some project uh, or maybe for master's thesis, and where is the, the, the current research? Well, first, people look at various machine learning algorithms and they are trying to figure out how to do this in federated learning settings. Once more, sharing without sharing for various machine learning algorithms. So you, are, you have to be able to do things locally, then you somehow update something common, and then you have new version that you're gonna be locally up training, sharing, up training, sharing. This is your model. Data is not exposed. There are attempts to put federated learning in new application domains. So there is, of course, image processing, but image processing has many names. You can have image processing for plant recognition. You may have image processing for medical images. You may have image processing for something that you're going to see in a moment, and I will explain to you in a moment. Data privacy protection, you know what? Even if you just share updates, there are methods to figure out something about your data. So there is research how to further protect what needs to be protected. It's very interesting research, involves high-level mathematics and a lot of experimentation. You can, uh, you can claim that you can protect the bandwidth. If you are doing a lot of things locally and only share updates, then you are sharing only very little information I mean, think about it. You are not sharing, you are not sending the whole model, you are not sending data, you are just sending a little bit the updates to particular neurons in a neural network, let's say. Um, there may be needs for various topologies. There may be groups of nodes. Here is one group, here is another group, here is another group. So maybe the group will first work together, with this group will work together, this will group work together, and then they will be sharing updates, but from groups. How this will affect the machine learning process? Will it be better? Will it be worse? If it's worse, how can we improve it? All of this is research. Here is, for instance, one of the research areas when data is not well balanced. And let me give you one of the examples. We will not go through all of them. Let's say that you want image recognition and you want to teach it how to um, recognize a house. And you have data which has houses, let's say from Sikkim. Why Sikkim? Because it's cold there, they are in the mountains, and I presume that houses in Sikkim may look differently from houses in Kerala. Houses near Goa beaches 
probably look different than houses in Sikkim. So now we are doing, you see, what we, what's happening here once more, stay with me. We are not sending images from Sikkim, images from Rajasthan, images from Haryana, together to one cloud to train recognition of houses. No. In Sikkim, we will have images from Sikkim training local node. In Rajasthan, we're going to have images from Jaipur being trained there. Suddenly, those local models are very different. How we deal with it if we want to build one model for housing recognition across all India? Or think about animals. In Australia, you have kangaroos, but you have no elephants other than in zoo. In India, you have elephants, but you don't have kangaroos. So if you do images from India with animals from India, and Australia with wombat and whatever, koala bear, yes, everybody loves koala bears. So we have plenty of koala bears here and no koala bears here. And then you have plenty of elephants and tigers here, and there is no elephants and no tigers here. Data is very unbalanced. How you build a joint model if the data is completely different in various places? Okay, this is all cool, yeah? Fine, plenty of academic research, academic, 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 but then comes the reality. Here is from our project. Uh, we have a European project in which one of the pilots is cohesive maintenance. What happens here is um, the company that um, we work with developed this thing. Um, you, you, you barely can see it. Okay, so uh, you have this gate, and the gate has uh, plenty of cameras on the left, on the right, on the top, and on the bottom. And when the car goes through it, there is a gazillion of, of images, pictures taken, that are of every little piece of this car. Okay? And those images are documentation of the state of the car. Let's say this is all, oh, parking at the airport. The car comes through this, this, this gate and you have information how the car actually looked like. So later on, you cannot have somebody telling you, hey, you scratched my car. Well, you, you know, there, there are bad people there who bring their scratched cars to parking lots and then on the way out, they say, hey, you scratched my car. You need to pay me. And then you have this thing and um, you say, no, 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 no. Sorry, man. We have here full documentation of the state of your car and there is nothing scratched on it. Forget it. Okay? But this means that various locations, various stakeholders, various companies, can use it to document the cars. We are talking car rental, we are talking parking lots, we are talking uh, dealerships. When you come to the dealership, there are people who come with scratch car to the dealership and then when they, for some repair, and when they get it back, they say, hey, you scratched my car. Of course, dealerships now know it and they have smartphones and they take photos, but this is an infrastructure that you just drive through and get the photos. But this introduces completely new set of requirements for the business process. 
What we have here is multiple stakeholders. Car rental, car parking, dealerships, production facilities, all of them can use one of those. Data processing cannot be done sometimes. Our partner says if there is a rush hour at the parking lot before a flight, then the cars, when they are passing or in the dealership, when people are coming in the morning to leave their cars, there is no way the machinery can process machine learning. It only can collect the data as the car is passing through. By the way, if the cars are going out, you need to have very fast reasoning. You need to have immediately recognition of what's going on. So you cannot do certain things. This is the practice. This is not academic world in which you can do things in rounds. Can you give me this? One second. It takes five or six seconds. Ah, yeah. Okay, now I can work. Okay, guys, so what we have here, multiple stakeholders, different owners of different scanners may not want to share their data. Hey, if you have two competing car rental companies, do you think that they will share their data? Of course not. But they need a joint image recognition model. All of those companies need to recognize where is the scratch, where is no scratch, and it needs to be extremely high quality recognition. So they have a reason to share it. But they don't want to share the data. They want the benefits of collaboration, but they still want to keep their privacy. They want to keep information. For instance, if, if car rental company A shared the data with car rental company B, then they would know how successful they are. So if one of those companies is less successful, they don't want to reveal it. But they want to share the updates to the model to be able to properly recognize scratched cars or slight dents or little damages. Or maybe if you have photographs from underneath, you can recognize immediately that there is an oil leak as the car is passing. It's doing the underneath inspection. Network bandwidth can be very heterogeneous. Some of those gateways may be in a place which has very good network connectivity, and the data will be passing through fast. Some of them may be in some not so well connected. It may not be the problem for this thing with the gateways, but it may be a problem in general. Heterogeneity is always a problem. Then you have devices. Various servers on various sites with various companies will vary in their capacity. Some companies have less powerful servers. Some have more powerful servers. As I told you, sometimes devices are busy. You cannot do rounds. Because if you try to do rounds of training, you will not succeed. There may be specific topologies that you don't control. In academic research, we are assuming, oh, I can control my topology and I can run some experiments with this and that topology. Here, your topology comes to you. Okay? There is difference between academic work where you assume topology and reality where topology is given to you and you have to deal with it. You have to adjust your work to the topology you will find there. Okay? So, this all means that federated learning as a new discipline, by the way, federated learning, first paper, is from 2019. 
Are you not kidding you? 1920, 2021, it's even not four years old yet as the concept, as the research. But from the point of view of its actual applicability, it has to grow up. We need actual research in distributed environments. We cannot do experiments in the cloud. We have to do, we have to realize that pre-processing has to be done. It is academic work starts with data which is pre-processed. Wrong. Pre-processing is part of the pipeline. And it has to be included in federated learning pipelines. Topologies may come to us, and we have to work with what's given to us. Learning process cannot be round-based. We cannot work, wait for lagouts, for dropouts. We have to design methods. And maybe somebody of you will do this, will study this, Design methods that work when some nodes will not deliver updates in time, whatever it time means. We also need to learn how to deal with constant flow of data. You know, in academic research, we have the whatever CIFAR data set. Well, beautiful, we have CIFAR. And what? What if there is a constant flow of data? And I think that one of the next speakers who is in the industry deals with situations, and this is extremely important, data is flowing. You cannot tell data stop. And from now on, we have the perfectly trained model. No, we don't have perfectly trained models. Models will be evolving over time. Federated learning models have to evolve, have to modify themselves over time. Each day there is more data. So, this is all that I wanted to share with you. I hope that this was some food for thoughts for you. That there is a new discipline, which is named federated learning. The discipline responds to share without sharing in the context of machine learning. And I know that a lot of you want machine learning because you know that it will get you a good job. Yeah, if you are a data specialist, you can get a good job if you know machine learning. So this area needs a lot of additional work, a lot of additional work. There's plenty of work for all of you to get into, to make it applicable in actual industrial settings. Now, how to find me? If you want to find me, don't find me on Facebook. Because I have two accounts and both of them are already with 5,000 each. Uh, yeah, I have more than 10,000 friends. I have no clue who they are. But um, don't, don't look for me on Facebook. If you look for me, look for me on LinkedIn. Um, you, you can find me, and for those of you who are faculty members, uh, with Professor Maria, we organized an absolutely beautiful conference that represents our style. By the way, this reminds me, the music that you had when there was the bouquet ceremony. I love it. This was great music, guys. It's kind of... I, I'm looking forward, by the way, if you have any ideas, connect me on LinkedIn and send me links to India-based folk heavy metal. Think about this. I want India-based, folk-based heavy metal from India. It can be even, you know, like death metal based on folk songs from India. I'm looking forward to this, okay? At this moment, thank you all very much, and uh, I will be here for a for this afternoon, I think there will be some session. So uh, if, if anybody would like to talk to, well, next will be Professor Maria or myself. Uh, we will be here. Uh, glad to talk to you. Thank you all. You have been a great audience. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions for sir? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, we do. 
So maybe request you to please answer the question. Who is the question? Yeah, right there. We can pass the mic there. So I hope my voice is audible to you. Yeah, it is. So hello, sir. My name is Zorbataj, and I'm third year student in CSC. Yes, sir. Over the past two years, COVID has impacted the industry a lot. In your uh, in your lecture, you uh, spoke about machine learning. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, what's the future of machine learning in healthcare industry, and how will it uh, evolve? Uh, will you will make a evolution there. Okay, so uh, there are two answers: the optimistic and the pessimist. The optimistic answer of machine learning in healthcare industry. Uh, is great, it can do. Uh, <laughs> uh, machine learning is great, it can do miraculous things, and if you read uh, research papers about um, prostate cancer recognition using machine learning or brain tumor recognition using machine learning. And then you read about this study in which there are a certain number of images and the recognition quality uh, is 97.25%. And we are all like, whoa, cool. And then you are finding out that the same model applied to a completely different set of data that comes from some completely different place is useless. Because this model works very well for the data it was trained on. So, on the one hand side, definitely, we have to move on, we have to explore machine learning in healthcare. Because potential is there, but we need to be extremely cautious. We cannot believe the hype. You see, IBM. Who knows the name IBM? Do you know IBM? Yeah, you do, of course, yeah. IBM created a project which was named Watson, which was for machine learning for healthcare. They pumped gazillions of dollars into it. They hired hundreds of people and you know what happened? Uh, it was, sorry, was it last year or was it early? The end of last year, they sold the whole project because they found out that after investing millions of dollars, seriously, IBM invested millions of dollars into Watson. IBM hired hundreds of people to work on Watson. They found out it simply does not work. They cannot deliver what they promised. So, yes, we have to. We should do more. We should understand better because we need it. No, at this moment, this is all hype and this is all marketing. Well, maybe not all. But majority of claims are high in, in market. Okay? Anybody else has any questions? Maybe one more. So much. Any no, we don't have time. You see? But find me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Indeed, I must say that was the recipe of the perfect for me. And we go back with the basic note of sharing without sharing. Thank you so much for that, sir. I now request Professor Maria Ganza to please join us on stage. She's an associate professor at the Warsaw University of Technology, Poland. She has her MS and PhD degrees in mathematics from Moscow State University, Russia, and a doctor of science degree in computer science from Polish Academy of Sciences. Ms. Maria has published to over 200 plus research papers and is on editorial board of five journals and a book series. She has been invited to program committees for more than 250 plus conferences and is a principal investigator of SRI PST in the Inter IoT project. 
here her team is responsible for the use of semantic technologies in the context of interporality of IoT programs. Welcome, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Good, because I cannot speak so loud like my colleague Marcin. Uh, okay, so I know that you're all very tired. Your mind is uh, uh, good or too much food, and your stomach not. So I will try to. Ah, yes. Uh, okay, let me start from a very short introduction of me, my university, and my city. I'm, uh, as you have heard, I'm from Poland. And this is a beautiful picture from, uh, from mainly from the drone, the center of the city uh, during the night, uh, very close to this uh, center. Um, uh, my university is located. Um, I discovered that it's more or less like you, your, your university, I mean, uh, lovely professional university by size, it's around 40,000 students. Uh, it has been um, founded, as you can see, in 1915, so it's more than 100 years already. And uh, on the uh, left hand side, you can see the picture of my faculty, uh, Mathematics and Information Science. It's a very young one, it's just 15 years, I'm working there. And um, what I would like to share with you today is what uh, we are doing there. It's a big part of uh, what our students are doing, uh, it's a machine learning. So as you know, there are different types of machine learning. We can say every time when uh, our neural network gives us an answer for the input, we can say, this is good, it's our feedback. And we call it supervised learning. Then another type of machine learning is unsupervised. We just get input to the machine, and waiting what machine answer will be. Usually it's uh, very popular right now for picture, for voice recognition, it's so-called deep neural network, or deep machine learning. And then one more time of uh, uh, machine learning is reinforcement learning. Uh, this is a very interesting domain with, uh, which has more common themes with how we uh, train our animal or how we people are learning. It's based on trial, error, and collecting of our experience. So it's uh, like human would like to know how to teach machine to think, to deal with reality like a human. Uh, it's also quite new domain. Uh, while it's appeared many years ago, it's the first idea about uh, such approach to neural network, to machine, how to, to uh, do it, artificial intelligence. It was in 1950, around, it's Turing who told uh, the first time about such approach. But, honestly, during the long time, this idea was in the shadow. The first time when we, oh, you probably heard about reinforcement learning, I think it was uh, because of AlphaGo. When AlphaGo beat a uh, world champion in Go. Do you know about this? Have you had? You know what? what the Go was a game when uh, the first uh, program computer uh, won a chess champion, uh, Ben Kasparov. Everybody, I mean, scientists, claim that Go will never 
uh, have such a program that computer could be a, a human being. Then, the ch like 10, 12 years later, we have a program. And moreover, this program to uh, teach himself by itself how to play in golf. And this is uh, reinforcement learning. A couple of years later, like in 2018, I think the next success uh, for reinforcement learning. And again, it's very uh, loud about it. Do you know the game Dota? Who played with it? In it? Okay, several people, yes. So, uh, it was a competition. This is a team game. And suddenly, several computers, so it means several uh, programs, discover how to play like a team. A big, the one of the best team in Dota. Of course, in not very full environment and so on, but it was amazing. The computer understood how the team works. So, just to remove magic from this, from this, I would like to explain very shortly, don't be scared, very shortly, and uh, with a minimal mathematics, uh, how it all works. Okay, very simple example. Maze. Let's put our robot in the maze. Like, uh, you know, this uh, Xiaomi uh, vacuum cleaner, this roundish stuff which are moving here and there in the, in the um, flat and try or pretend to, to clean the flat. Uh, okay, so how robot discover what robot has to do? What robot understand? Numbers. Robot can operate with numbers, can compare numbers. So, how we can explain robot what to do? Okay, as soon as robot moves to the next position where robot has to make a decision going left, going right, or going ahead, or turn back, we give him a number. This position brings you this number. This is an information what we tell robots. Then, let's see what robot has to do. Just discovery of the shape of this maze or to find the shortest way from this maze. If just discovery, good. As long as our robot will be in the maze, as many new positions this robot will discover, it, this robot will receive more like number, in numbers. Uh, it, we call it reward. But if we would like to save our robot, that find please the shortest way from the maze, we will put here some discount. The longer robots stay in the maze, the smaller reward this robot will get. And this is a very simple idea how re uh, reinforcement learning works. Simple? Not exactly. Why? Because uh, the maze is a very simple example. This is the situation when the robot can assign to all its position the number. What will happen if the environment in which robot is working is huge and unknown? Like we send our robot to the moon, to the Mars, to discover this planet. Uh, in this case, we got a, a little bit different methods. Methods which bring us the knowledge about only part of this environment. One of these methods is the Monte Carlo method. So we have many samples, like we put robot here, and robot discovered what happened around, put robot in another place, let the robot discover what is there, and then we calculated average knowledge. But still, it works very slow. What to do? 
Uh, let's consider one simple example. Uh, we have our home uh, or our office and we are going to go home. So we see that the uh, road will uh, the, the way to home to go home took us uh, like half an hour. Then suddenly we discovered that this is a rain. So we have to find some umbrella to go to the car, and in the rain, all the cars are moving slower. So immediately after leaving the office, we make a correction. Okay, probably the uh, way home will take us like 35 minutes. Then there is a traffic jam, a no traffic jam, and so on. Every time we are correcting our prediction. And this is a, a very similar uh, method. We call it um, temporal difference learning, which are quite similar to Monte Carlo. But what Monte Carlo is doing, we are traveling home and then look back to our trip home. We evaluated how good or how wrong was our prediction. In temporal difference learning, we do it on every step. Rain, traffic jam, uh, jam no traffic jam, and so on. And this is one of the fastest ways how to um, teach our robot program uh, agent to deal with unknown or model-free environment. Uh, then, Okay, but what if the environment is really huge? It's an image. How computer robot can understand image? From the other side, we know that uh, deep neural network um, are very good in image recognition. So let's do the further things. Here is do you know the game? What's the name of the game? Ma? Ma? Mario, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you are not sleeping, I'm just checking. Uh, this is the game Mario. And uh, how uh, the, okay, the program which is responsible for Mario movement can recognize what to do, to jump or to, to go or to run. And we take a picture put it in the neural network, recognize what is going on the screen, and then answer, based on this answer of this neural network, we command or make an order to uh, uh, Mario what to do. And this is so-called deep reinforcement learning, you see? And this is a very, very beautiful situation. So we have agent, Mario, he is in perfect state and waiting what to do. Neural network gave him um, a recommendation, jump. Mario jump, and then if he will, I don't know, hit in the wall, immediately neural network receive a feedback and can improve the result. And next time it will be more successful. Okay, so um, I would like uh, to make more realistic uh, example. Look at this, uh, this picture. I don't know if we can, you can start this movie. And now the music will be. This one, right? Yes. yes. So, <laughs> Is 
probably, if you will be in the car with no lecture before, probably you will do the same. But then, many, 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 many trials from different places with different parents. Uh, in 5,000 trails, you see, it's already much better. Again, oh, oh but still it's much better. Okay, let's wait a little bit more. One hundred thousand trials. Nice. Huh? See? It's almost perfect. And this is Sorry, I will stop it because it's a very interesting movie. You can easily find it. Second. No, no, just presentation. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, you can easily find it and look, uh, watch it till the end. Uh, so it took. Five million trials, more than five million trials to teach this car to park appropriately. As you can imagine, it took a bunch of time. So, what is the next improvement? What we can do? We can do the following things. This is how we teach our single car. Then we can create a model many models of the same parking and put cars there and tell them to teach how to park. So because uh, this is for this car will be a different environment, they will teach the situation in a little bit different way and share their knowledge. And this will uh, quite seriously improve, make it faster to teach how to uh, deal with parking, for example, or in this place, how to play a uh, volleyball, or, and so on, so on. Uh, sorry. Okay, because uh, they were uh, talking about um, in Internet of Things, I would like to include this one slide. What reinforcement learning can bring to Internet of Things? The situation that we really uh, can have a two way how to understand or our devices can understand and can deal with what's happening. We can create model like in case of maze. We can calculate everything, describe equations and zillion and equations. And in this case, that every minimal changes will require a lot of effort from scientists, from specialists, from, from those who produce a requirement, who check this model, and so on. But from the other side, we can uh, approach to this problem exactly like reinforcement learning does. No model, just teach yourself based on what happened. Of course, we have to have uh, quite a lot of data and give this data to the computer and to allow the computer to teach what to do with all this data and how to manage, in this case, the electricity which we receive from um, uh, this uh, green uh, sustainable uh, source like uh, uh, like the um, sun battery or wind or water and so on, how to combine it with a stable source of energy. So, uh, going, to, uh, going to the what is a real 
possibility of reinforcement learning a lot. Every time when the, mod the process of modeling of the environment of the problem is a quite um, difficult or almost impossible, we can use reinforcement learning. So, you see, harvesting, how much members of population to keep, how, we can, how much we can remove. Uh, agriculture, because it's a uh, Punjab, it's uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture uh, state, so agriculture. How much plant based on weather and soil we have to uh, put in the, um, in the soil? Water resource. Inspection and maintenance. Martin already told you about maintenance. So, how uh, many machines we have to have to do the uh, very successful maintenance. If something bad will happen with one machine, how many machines we have to have? Purchase production, queues, finance, board games, and of course, and of course, uh, robots. I started from robots, so I would like to finish with robots. So, uh, this is a funny movie, but think about it. We have to uh, understand how the environment, the environment is not a no problem. A lot of training on your computer simulation, and then you can get something like this. While you're training, you can ask your team to find the robot, and then you can see with your robot and then to the movie. And uh, okay, and now about something serious, just to, to finish my talk. So, what do we need really in reinforcement learning? Um, reward. So, how to explain a robot what we are waiting for me? We, the only way how to explain it, it is a reward. This is a lot of work how to make it understand. In case of maze, it was very easy, but in case of robot, uh, we had a student who tried to, learn, to, to teach his robot just to stay. It took him something like three months, and still he was not very successful. Uh, reproducibility issue. It's very hard to repeat the experience or experiment because the environment is not deterministic. So every time we receive something new, 
So how we can check that it will work in every possible environment? Um, oh, performing a real life scenario. I told you about the reality. We send our robot to the moon. How we can prepare this robot? What will happen there? We, by ourselves, we don't, don't have a full uh, knowledge about this environment. The same is, uh, situation is to send our robot in some damaged, uh, damaged region, like uh, destroyed building and so on. Again, we do not have knowledge, but we have to send robot to deal with this. And um, I think that's the most important uh, challenges which are in front of science. So if you join the class, you are very, very well. You can find me very easy uh, by mail, and we can discuss if you wish to, to deal with these challenges and to share your knowledge or problem or question and so on. Thank you very much. Oh, we can do. Oh, we can discuss it later. You can find me here. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Do we have questions from the audience? Not really. So I think we are going to request for questions a little later. I must say that was very, very impressive, ma'am. Indeed, we've learned. I have a question. Okay, we have a few questions. Maybe yeah, request for your cooperation for the same ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Ma as Elon Musk once said that he fears that one day robots could endanger us humans. So, what's your point on his statement? Can I request the support team to please help us here? So we have a microphone right there. The other side, please. Hey, sure. So could you please repeat the beginning of the question? It's learning uh, all knowledge what they have they will get from us okay so uh, it's it's uh, depend on us how we teach this robot if we teach this robot to uh, eliminate us Thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderful question. So indeed, we still know that humans are a little more powerful. And uh, we will make sure that when you talk about reinforced learning, we will ensure that we only make the robots learn what it needs to. All right. With, without further ado, I call upon a passionate and a fast learner, a dependable person with 22 plus years of industry experience, the vice president of GenPact, an author of the book called Corporate Leadership, the balance of mind and heart, a firm believer of excellence, who has resulted in the university gold medal of winning CEO award and a diamond award. With 22 plus years of corporate experience and work with global organizations like NewGen, Infosys, Tech Mahindra, and GenPad, she has worked in various capacities, starting from a software engineer to a senior executive. She has played yeah, multiple that, roles that and has led enterprise products leveraging latest technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, NLP, .NET, 
to name a few. Her strength lies in leading teams of multi-million dollar program and businesses. She's a global enthusiast traveler with a rich experience of working in varied geographies, cultures, and complex business environment. I request Dr. Richard Jain to please enlighten our audience with her words of wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, please give ma'am a huge round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. No, your two of your sirs earlier said that they need to wear it. Isn't it? Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> wow, that's an audience. Great. So I am Richard Jain Gupta, and I'm standing here because of my passion. A lot of people ask me almost every day, Richard, you have 22 plus years of experience in the industry. You could have easily, easily be settled in US, UK, Europe, Australia, and all wherever you want. So I tell them, no, you're right. My bosses, since last 15 years, are telling me, you put finger on the globe, anywhere, any country, and they'll send you. Then, why did you go, Richard? Any essays? Any essays? I love my country, okay? What else? Okay, I want to dwell in India, okay? What else? I am passionate about these audience. I want to, I want to energize my youth. I want to empower my youth. I'm here with all of you. With this, I'll just get started. I'm being told by Rachid sir that I have little less time because I'm standing between your lunch, right? Okay. I I make sure that uh, this lot of things we've already learned on machine learning, right? Wasn't it awesome? I personally learned so much, Martin sir and my man. It was fantastic from both of you. I don't think I can go to that level for sure, but I'm going to cover some industry aspects to you. So I started with how many of you wants jobs? Can I see hands? How many of you wants jobs? Come on, even after much is it for you, no? Come on, you want? Okay, okay. So I believe that all of you are Gen Z. You don't need to be told how to do things. You need to be told what to be done. I'm here today to tell you what needs to be done not only to get placed, not only to get jobs, but how do you enjoy your life? Okay? So I'll try to not stick to one piece and take too much time and keep moving. Today I'm going to talk about what are some of the innovations in computer science we as industry leaders are looking for. What are the few challenges, opportunities and trends? Innovations in computer science that change the human world. I'm going to show some quick pictures and I would like you to tell me what is that. Anyone? Alexa? Yes, most of you know it. Five years back, did you think about this? That something like this can be there? No? Okay, next one. Come on. What's the name of this? Rover. Someone said there, Rover. So it's a Mars rover that India sent to as a part of Mission Mars. What's this? Anyone? So how many of you have sat in the flights? All of you? All of you? Okay. 50%, 70%? Yes? So, there is just a few minutes difference between two flights. Right? And every day it keeps going. How do they make it happen that it is always maintained, clean, everything is nice? How do 
Big Sean. There's a clue I'm giving. It's an air robot. It's a robot that was made to, uh, made to maintain the airplanes. Anyone? I think you've seen this. Some of this part in dance, dancing video. So it's the, the particular one is right here, robot now. Anyone? Easy. You might have seen somewhere. These are automotive industry robots. We know that nowadays cars are assembled through the robots. Right? Yeah, anyone? No? Space, yes. It's related to space. It's a special purpose death resistance manipulator, which is used by space scientists. Okay. Why I am showing you, why did I show you all this? Because I just wanted to tell you, I don't want to tell you how. I just want to tell you what you need to do. What you need to see around. Do you see any more artificial intelligence applications around you? Any more examples? Too many, I have not shown you all. No? I didn't hear? You spoke so much about machine learning. Of course it's a trend. And any example, anyone wants to shout out loud, which I have not shown? Laptop? Camera? Okay. It's getting, it's getting interesting. Okay, no. Google Assistant, yes. You're right. Okay, great. So our life is getting dominated by all these artificial intelligence devices, softwares, and it's okay to have this around. So that's why I said AI and machine learning is one of the latest trends. Virtual reality and augmented reality, and I'll come to the details of it. Robotics, ma'am has shown a very good picture on that. Data science and big data. So I am covering all these pieces that we, we work in industry. Any of the top industries today are working on these technologies. Natural, natural language processing and clouds and AI computing. So I'm going to cover very quickly these topics and I'll try to touch that with some examples so that you don't sleep and you don't feel hungry. Okay, let us understand how these are connected first. I've kept it very, very simple so that you can just start from how these all are connected. I mean, I have seen people loosely use words like NLU, ML, AI, but they don't know how these all are connected. So I'll just try to keep it very, very simple for you. AI is a larger umbrella under which you can say it's a machine learning. You know, machine learning is one component of AI. And then there's deep learning, and then there is neural network, a specific kind of algorithms. Man has covered some part of neural networks. So let's see what are they. So AI, all of you know, when computers start thinking like human beings. Yeah? We just saw an example where computer actually won from the human being in chess. So machine learning, when we actually not program, we train machine through the data as we have been talking since morning, so I'm just fast forwarding it. Deep learning, when this is a type of ML, that trains computer to do what comes naturally to human being. Let's say I'm just walking here and there is a dice. Obviously human being, I know I'll fall off, right? So I'll stop here and I'll go this side. If I move here, I know I don't have to go, I come back. So that's exactly what you saw in that parking example. The car is behaving like that, yes? So that is what is deep learning. And then neural networks, Example is same when we when we have interconnected 
called interconnected models where we try to train the model, interconnected structure. Then there are some pieces loosely we use in the current innovations where we need to understand how are they connected to the current so cloud computing is one, I'm sure all of you are hearing it big time. We are in here, they are just part of AI. There's no connection to other things. And then we have robotics. It is a combination of AI and machine learning. And then we have data science. Okay. So let's understand why we need to do that. Before I go to why piece of it. I'll just take an example of the product that we have in Genpack that we bring a lot of efficiencies for our customers. We have an engine called Computer Vision Machine. Computer Vision Machine. So what we do there is we extract data from the images. So how many of you heard about Genpack? No, yes, more or less. It is India's first BPO company the market leaders in BPO. However, it's not till that. They have moved into digital BPO. They are the market leaders who taught the entire world how BPOs can be done using digital. The transformation. Let me take an example. So, if you, when you go back home today, ask your parents if they took loan 30 years back, how many days it took so that loan to come, that amount to come in their home, in their uh, you know, hand. So they'll say 30 days, 25 days. The average was 22 days. Someone somewhere sat down and thought, why can't we, why can't we expedite this? Why can't we reduce it to 15 days? So someone automated it, someone just created a bank site. You can fill online your loan, you no more need to go to bank. But still, to submit your documents, you have to go to bank. Then someone digitized it a little more. You can go to bank with the documents. Rather than that, you can just submit online. But still, it was 10, 12 days. Can someone answer how much time today it takes to get a loan? Say, say loudly, how much? Minutes? Seconds? One week, seconds, half an hour, half an hour, okay, two minutes, oh yes, when I log into my ICICI bank account today, it says, Richard, you are eligible for so and so loan, why don't you click on this button and you get loan in your account, that very moment, how did this happen? Come on, come on, think. How did this happen? It's called business transformation. What we did was, we thought, we divided the entire process of loan into 10, 12 processes. And we thought the process number one is taking so much time. Process number two is taking so much time. Process number 10 is taking so much time. So, can I automate first one? Okay, pick. Then we realized the maximum time that goes in loan processing is, anyone? Checking the credit history of the person. Are you able to connect? How, how can I give loan to someone who cannot return me? So checking the credit history of the person was taking the maximum time. So what did banks do? They started checking credit history of a person upfront. There are third party risk tracking systems in the market. You log in there, they will tell you can Richard, what is the amount that Richard can be eligible for loan? How much amount she can give back? So guys, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not trying to say, um, you know, deviate from this technology topic. What I'm trying to tell you is technology alone is not enough. I am today challenging and encouraging all of you to start thinking business. Technology, as Navi Rapsar said in the beginning, it's not about syntax, it's about logics. So just work on your logics, 
Learn any language you want, C, C++, Python, you know, you name it. Any language you learn, it's okay. One language. But focus on the business part of it. How can you just look around? You're going in a train, in a metro, in a Delhi station. See, how come, how many of you sat in metro? So, when some station is coming, what does it happen? There is an announcement, you hear? Right? How that happens? Okay, maybe we have taught them at this time, train will reach to this station. But imagine if the train is late or early, still the announcement happening. How? AI combination of domain, the sensors, the use of sensors. So which means you need to start thinking beyond technology. That is what industry is today. The person who knows technology from college and can think about the business around is the winner, is the successful person. Okay? With that, I'll just um, move forward. So, how did AI come into picture and how can we little bit understand the trends in the industry that we see? So, way back, end of 18th century, we were water, steam power and all that. End of 19th century, we start getting electricity. End of 20th, 20th century, we got computers and that was the computer revolution. Today, it's about AI, ML, IoT, which we have been hearing since morning. Okay, I again fast forward this slide because we have learned today what is supervised machine learning, unsupervised, reinforced. So I will just fast forward this piece I'm not covering. But I just want to tell you as students, ability to identify patterns in the data. If you want to work in ML, you want to do some projects in ML, first start learning the patterns. I was taking an example of my product, which was computer uh, machine vision. What it does is, it extracts data from the images. Using ML, it will figure out, let's say, uh, we, have, uh, we have a process called accounts table. In that, we get invoices. So when we, when we extract data from those invoices, those invoices can be of 100,000 formats. I can tell machine that, Pull invoice number from here, pull invoice date from here, pull vendor number from here, but that's not enough. The moment second image comes, the data is changed. Maybe it is not called invoice number also. There is a Spanish, in Spanish language they may call it factual. How do we teach my machine? That is the perfect application of ML that you can think of, you know, to start with. Create engines for yourself. To take small small projects to yourself in the in the college itself. Try doing some piece of it. And uh, I have some conversations planned today. I'm going to offer some of the ideas that I give some projects and students can do that. So another piece is ability to build models to make predictions, as I was talking. Ability to tune models. Only making ML models is not enough. You need to keep tuning it. That is what is important. Ability to evaluate models for accuracy. If we have models, but imagine Alexa is doing mistakes. How many of you have teased Alexa with tough questions? You have? What does she do? Okay, so how many of you think Alexa gives wrong answers. No one? Right? Okay, you have seen one wrong answer? Okay. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell is accuracy is the key. If you're creating a model, it's not accurate, it's going to give, going to give you incorrect data, it's not useful. So the continuous accuracy improvement is going to be the key. And of course, ability to work with large data sets we have been learning from on it. 
another technology that is really coming in is virtual reality and augmented reality. Most of it you can see in education, entertainment, space and military and digital marketing. So, what is VR? Anyone knows what is VR? Examples. Can someone give me example of VR? Microsoft, sorry. Okay. Google Lens, someone said. Google Lens, someone said, I know. Okay. So, virtual reality is when the use of technology to create a simulated environment. You start feeling as a part of that environment, 360 degree. That's what is VR. Most of the education system, games you play, become part of it. So what happens there is, so uh, there are three kind of VRs that I just want to quickly talk about. Non-immersive, where we use devices like keyboards, mouses. Okay? Semi-immersive, where we use 3D, 3D graphics. And the fully immersive ones where, um, have you seen that Microsoft glass that comes or with an eye? You see? Anyone examples you've seen? You wear that and you feel part of it. Right? Try to go to YouTube or Google today and check about it. What is VR? What is fully immersive VR? Next one is augmented reality. So AR is something where we integrate the digital information with the user environment. Typical example would be retail online app. How many of you shop at uh, Amazon? All of you do that. Or probably your mom, your dad. Yes, you do it. So let's say you search for a Redmi phone latest phone today. What happens in the evening when you open your phone? It starts suggesting you. Yeah, it starts suggesting you on your Facebook, on your other uh, softwares that you can buy this from here. You search for trip on a make my trip today. What happens next? It keeps giving you advertisement. Right? That's what it is all about. Robotics. So we have seen a live robotic today, a robot today, but why robot? So um, there is this robotic, uh, there was these vacuum cleaners which used to come earlier. All of you have seen, with the hand we used to use, it was such a revolution those days. Oh my god, I have a vacuum cleaner, right? Has someone seen a vacuum cleaner that works on its own? During COVID times, when no maids were there, and sir, in India, maid, having a maid is a big thing. So in COVID, we didn't have any maids at home, no workers. So, can someone name it? Which company got it? What was the name of that logo? Means Arya, you all are sleepy? Hungry? <laughs> okay, let them I tell you. So this one from uh, Eureka Fox and one from MI. Beautiful robo, just this size, like Alexa, a little, little bigger than that. It can walk anywhere. It can actually clean your home entirely. Beautiful, a simple example. So it's changed. Robots are changing our world. So I don't need to tell you why we need them. There are some dangerous jobs you will do. We can replace robots with that. There are things that we do in military. There was a famous Bollywood movie where they have shown, shown that there was a difficult work that was replaced by a drone. Remember? Puri. Yes, someone said it right. Puri. So we saw that they went to the enemy's home. It was actually doing something which a human being will be dangerous for a human being. Right? So there are many, many opportunities, guys. You are 
people who are looking for future in this. There are robotic engineers, algorithm engineers, data scientists, software engineers, robotic research scientists. Endless opportunity in RPA world. We have a large unit of RPA in our organization. So, we are, I'm just quickly will cover this data science and big data piece. What is this monster of data all about? Everyone keep talking about data, data, data. What is this all about? So, in case you want to teach machine, in case you, so how can we work? When I am a child, I'm not that wise. I'm not able to make decisions. As I grow up, as I grow up, there's a knowledge that goes into my mind. Parents are able to make decisions of my own. The same thing works with machines. So that is where the data plays an important role. So credit risk score is an example I've taken it earlier. How we do? Um, so how does this supply demand industry work? This has played an important role in that. So we look at the data, we predict what kind of demand will come. So based on that, the market creates the products. Big data is something again that can be with large set of data. This data can be collected from public or this can be fetched. An important concept that we have not touched completely, I think Mariman touched a little bit, I want to talk about this, a beautiful product we at Genpact have on NLU. So what you do is, imagine that today you call a lot of help desk, a lot of customer support, or you send emails, let's see with the Intel phone, idea phone, do you think there is a human being sitting there and answering your email and your phone? How many of you think there is a human being who is answering your phone? No. How many of you think there is a, there's a human being sitting answering your emails there? They are not. We have natural language processing used. We, let's say you write an email to help desk. They will do sentiment analysis to that. Summarization of the text. They will think, oh, if the person has used words like your service is rubbish, your service is not good, they kind of find out, oh, the person is angry. If the person says, your service is great, so they have these keywords, they search, they do a sentiment analysis on a given text and they find out what is the mood of the person who has written this. So speech recognition. So Alexa, how many of you have Alexa at home? Okay. Can it recognize only one voice or multiple voices? Multiple? How? How it can identify? Because there is a speech recognition technique used in that. Yeah? How many of you know the WhatsApp feature where if I speak, WhatsApp write on its own? Yes? Again, say. I've given you image recognition example where we do the where we do the text summarization and recognition. Okay, text classification. I've given you example. So one example I want to give is language neutralization. So world is changing. We are going global. How come you change? How come? Have you seen the UN speeches anytime? People are with their headphones. Modi ji is speaking in Hindi. How come they are understanding? How come they are understanding the speech? Because he is speaking in Hindi and they don't understand Hindi. Language neutralization play a major role in that. Imagine it is so fast that as he is speaking there, everyone in their own language are getting in their earphone. Imagine the power of this. I'll take some examples again. Spell check you use in Word, MS Word, autocomplete, WhatsApp, Facebook, you write a word and it completes your sentence. You say, 
Congratulations, then it shows you and best wishes automatically. Right? Voice text messaging, spam filters. If, if males are not going to post to spam filter automatically. So these are a few more examples we have. Quickly, last but not least, I want to cover is cloud. Um, okay. Hungry? So then I should not hear a noise if you are hungry. Then I finish it quickly. Okay? Hungry that side? Yes, then no noise. Okay. What is cloud? I don't need to tell all of you. All of you know what is cloud. Cloud is a very sophisticated way of keeping your data that in the past days were not available, past years. And I know my dad who's using computers since 1988, how much difficulty he had if his uh, you know, computer crashes or uh, the floppy crashes and the data is gone. So, this is the most sophisticated way at least I have seen. How many of you know about the Microsoft Cloud Services? Have you heard? Guys, I uh, go back to the where I started from. You are my youth. I'm going to tell you what to do. How please you need to find out. So listen carefully the terms I'm using. How many of you have heard about Microsoft Microservices? So what Microsoft came back and of course Google was a very, very unique concept where they started creating small, small microservices. If my data is hosted on cloud, <coughs> I can directly use their service and do things. Lot of things, lot of computation they have to do. Okay. I can increase, decrease the space, so it's very easy. I don't need to go buy another computer. So there are three kind of clouds, private, public, hybrid. Go find out when do we use public, private. These are the questions you will be asked in the interviews. So please keep looking for answers to this. Okay, there are the huge, huge, huge opportunity guys. People who are interested in data storage, infrastructure, it's a huge opportunity. The cloud scientists, the cloud engineers are paid very heavily. So please do some cloud certifications. Try to learn about cloud. Do your projects in cloud. Huge opportunity. Uh, there is a mandate for us in our company to go cloud. We, we don't have anything on our servers. There are just very old applications that are there and we have to mandate either you Close it or you move it to cloud. Okay. An important page for all of you. A challenge that we at industry are facing today. First challenge is the skills. We pick a lot of people from colleges every year. What we find is that adopting skills is an issue. Guys, I am encouraging you today to adopt skills, adopt new skills. Raviraj sir said an important thing in the morning. He said, unlearn and relearn. Guys, coming from industry, I can tell you, if you don't unlearn, if you think you know everything in the world, you will not be successful. Unlearn what you know and relearn. When I'm talking here, there's a technology changing somewhere. So, here are the few things I have listed. Full stack Java development, Python, domain and business knowledge as I was explaining, and the soft skill piece. Back few years when we used to hire people from colleges, they were very good at technology. They were not good at talking. All of you are good at talking? Can't hear. All of you are good at talking? <laughs> Will you make sure when you go home today, from today you start? And you make sure when your interviews happen, you are good at talking. Okay? Practice it. Go learn about what are soft skills. That's what going to get you win in the industry. Second thing which I am talking about is 
the improved business processes. I think I'll just fast forward it. We've spoken about loan processing example. We've spoken about how business play an important role in this. And here is my recommendation. This is what we at Genpet do. We combine process, industry, and technology. And first, with the flavor of soft skills from our people, and that's what makes us successful company. With this, I'll just conclude. And a lot of people who know me personally, my style, they know that I do things for Shairana and that. So I end it with that. Listen carefully, all of you. It's for all of you. Palak ko zind hai jaha bichliya girane ki. Palak ko zind hai jaha bichliya girane ki. Hame bhi zind hai wahi aashya bana ke ki. Thank you so much, ma'am. I must say you've mesmerized the audience, not only with your thoughts on the technical expertise, but also the shairana andaz that you have. So may I request the audience to please give ma'am a huge round of applause. I think you've enthralled the audience so well, ma'am, that forget about feeling hungry. They are really looking forward for the next speaker. So without further ado, I request a senior academician. All right, students, can we have some silence, please? No, not really. Okay, so for that, I would request if you have so much of energy, let's give a huge round of applause for yourself for being here. Come on. All right. So I request a senior academic and a chartered engineer with 30 years of industry and research experience with intensive teaching and administrative portfolio. A man who's been a chartered engineer in UK and Sri Lanka, a member of Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka, and a founder chair man of IEEE Sri Lanka Center Region Subsection. The person who is the present director, Engineer Technology Incubation Center, Faculty of Engineering. The former director of Engineering Education Unit, Faculty of Engineering. The man who has been awarded the National Science and Technology Award by His Excellency President of Sri Lanka. The man who has been awarded the Best on the Job Research and Development Award by the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. We are talking about none other than Dr. Kamal Nath Samrakur. So we request you to please join us on stage. Boys and girls and ladies and gentlemen, can you please give him a huge round of applause. We would be winding up very soon, so I would request each one of you to keep patience with us, please. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. So, can you give me 15 minutes or 20 minutes? Are you hungry? I know that. I'm sorry, but this is the reality. Okay? So give me 15 minutes or 20 minutes maximum to make sure that I have many signs, but I'll try to go as fast as I can. I can go. The, the problem is, are you hungry? You know what is the hunger? But there are millions of people out there feeling hungry. Right? So, when I was preparing this presentation, I found that the Prime Minister is saying the India will be a developed country in 25 years. Is it true? He <laughs> said so. So, do you want to wait another 25 years to make this country developed? And I was amazed and I, I found that a little bit deeper and found out what exactly was people. Because India is the fifth largest economy in the world. And also one of the past growing economies. And all the world richest people, like some of the parents. And then, for some reason, India is not good. I, I have figured out a couple of things like large population, this kind of uh, distribution, 
legal taxes to education, and then I go into statistics and how it makes us India is not possibly as a country like Sri Lanka. Right? It's amazing. You know what happened to Sri Lanka in Israel, right? But India is the number is below Sri Lanka. So then I found what they are talking about. This development index, human development index, they are looking at the life expectancy in health and in education and the GDP, the income. So because of these numbers, are not there, India and Sri Lanka are not in, in developed countries. Right? So if you go into the details, you, you know, the, you can see the trends, right? So Sri Lanka is here, India is here, okay? Then the Prime Minister said, a couple of weeks in this speech, education policy, making India fight against corruption and digital India. Am I correct? Yeah, he said. So uh, we have a setup where we can think of as engineers and as uh, uh, money uh, people who want to come to the ICT industry. And Sri Lanka is not different. In some cases, massive differences in scale. The population and the international level, more or less the same. And education is a little bit better than India. And IC sector, ICT sector is developing in India. Right? So, you can be the next educator and you can join the university because uh, Professor Masina wanted you to uh, join the research. Okay, if you want to become a researcher, please join it. If you want to become an educator, join the university. But there are ample opportunities for you to become the next the, the big company in India because we have a lot of problems that we have not found solutions for. So you can see the ICT benefit for Sri Lanka, they were talking in 1960s, 1980s in Sri Lanka, the present chairman at that time. So he introduced ICT policy at that time. But you know what happened to Sri Lanka. And you are working, your, your people are working in ICT industry for long, but still your president is saying, we will be developing another 25 years. So there are a lot of opportunities for you and for us. So if you want to be, uh, become entrepreneurs, ample opportunity. Think about, and as I said, you can join the research, that's fine. If not, think about the problems that you have, in lo a local problems, where you can find many things that you can do to this country and also to the around you. If the, if the problems are same, you have a market to sell your product, sell your company uh, product to other countries, right? So well, trends in computing, there are many things you have heard. And if you want to work in those areas, fine, so be it. But as I said, we can concentrate on local problems, those who want to do that. And maybe it's in India, maybe it's in China. But now, as I as it was mentioned, I need something to give a solution for a local problem. Right? And I was awarded the national award. And in newspapers it was appeared. But nothing has happened now. Right? So the issue is we I mean, as I said, we can concentrate on corruption, agriculture, education, health, a lot of areas that we are working, we can work on. But the issue is, these problems are not simple problems. Right? Do I agree with you? They are, are intertwined with other things. The simple problems are not simple. So they are complex, and they have, they have science and engineering behind them, they need science and engineering. And similarly, the economic impact of your work is there. And then diverse social groups, they have to address those people. And then national security, security might come when you are doing something. So the problems are not simple and you need multidisciplinary, multi-agency, multi-sectoral approach. 
तो वो कंप्लेक्स सॉल्यूशन बिकॉज़ आई हैव टू पॉइंट्स टू सेस हियर वी कलैबोरेशन राइट सो कंप्लेक्सेशन फॉरली एंड डेटा एनालिटिक्स इज वन ऑफ द एरियाज दैट वी हैव बीन टॉकिंग टुडे यू हैव एम्पल ऑपर्चुनिटीज बट वी आर गोइंग टू टू वर्क ऑन बोथ एरियाज uh there are a lot of issues it was competition for the then i found this document prepared by the advisory committee to the president of america in 2008 we call document but they were talking about couple of issues hardware software managing data so these three problems are already solved i mean you are lucky right i have am going to elaborate But these are the computers that we were doing, right? I know, I know. I, I. So this hard drive is about two point and three point five megahertz, right? And I use this computer to learn machine language. But you are, you are very lucky, right? So, but in hardware development, you know that the thing is there, but now the size of the Transistors, you can see increase, um, the decrease, and number of transistors you can increase, but the clock speed you cannot increase. You know why, right? The issues of heat dissipation. So then, what we do is we build for supercomputers and lot of teraflops and cores are there, billions of cores, and we don't see that the supercomputers in, in the world. So there are supercomputers with eight billion cores, right? Well, fast, fast computer. You can see a picture of it. But India launched National Supercomputer Mission in 1950. So you have supercomputers in India. So as I said, you have access to all those things. Once you have digital India, you have everything. And then for local problems, to address local problems, you have navigation systems belong to India, right? So you can use these opportunities. And then. The challenges managing data repository again you have cloud so that you have it. the challenges of that is already been solved in most in most of the cases so there are a lot of applications you can try from agriculture precision agriculture health telemedicine telemedicine telehealth and this is from Rwanda they are delivering medical supplies within 20 minutes. You see drones. You might have heard that. So these are from internet. I found. Then these are some education. You can do a lot of things to your own country. And in education, I'm I'm just coming through the APT that you have. But there are several other ways of uh, uh, providing learning to the poor. Right? There are there are many people who are deprived of education. So you can find solution for those applications. Right, so I am skipping this thing. Then remote lab. So we have been developing this remote lab so that the people, the, the students, who are in remote areas, they cannot come to the university, but they can log into the system and then develop I and mean, do the practical experiments. Uh, those are doing uh, engineering pretty well. Right, so that is one of the areas we can think of. But the accessibility will be there once you have the digital India. But the issues in computer computation science. Mainly because of the nature of the computation science, that is the universality. Because the computation science is belongs to everybody. Everybody talks about that. So computer people talks about that. But the domain of your working in is belongs to different people. So we need collaboration. Without collaboration, you cannot work. Right? So in that particular report. They are saying the institution structure is not adequate, right? So when you are when you are going to work on those areas, computation modeling, you have to work in different areas, but the structure is not supporting you. A lot of problems you have faced. A lot of problems. So, but as I said, I, after this initiative, nothing happened. So, recommendation: you should have a lot of institutional reforms to have. A better environment for you to work in, right? But in that sense, and two examples I have given: 
So recently I visited these universities in, in France. Four universities got together and made a, made a big university, University of Paris, Saclay. Four universities and two institutions to make a very big university because they need the collaboration. And in Finland, I have seen three universities got together and made a, another university. Right? So why these people, they need collaboration? So my point is, you need collaboration and University of Pelagini and NPU, we have already started collaboration. So we do have ample opportunity in the ground where there are several problems that are not yet addressed. At the same time, you have a lot of uh, other departments that you can work with. Right? Medical or uh, you don't have the medical, but some about 40 50 other disciplines where you find the problems from those domains and work with them and they provide solutions. So similarly with Minister of Canada, we have agreement, so we can think of further collaboration. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was an honor having you here with us. Thank you very much. As we proceed further for the last session of Dr. Sri Ram Vasudeva, a man with experience of industry and academia of 15 plus years, a man who holds a doctorate degree in embedded systems. He's authored and co-authored 45 plus books in various publications from the University of Oxford Press and YD. He's been granted 30 patents so far and he is a hackathon enthusiast who's been awarded by Harvard University. So I request our technical team to help us connect with him. Boys and girls and ladies and gentlemen, may I please request you to give him a huge round of applause and welcome him virtually with us. By the time our technical team helps us get connected with him, I request all the students at the back to kindly settle down. So can we please start? Dr. Vasudevan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. We can start. Yeah, I can hear you. We can start. So, yeah, we're not able to hear you. I can hear you. Give us a minute. Let us check on this, sir. One second. Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, you are on mute. Hello, I'm just checking. I'm just checking. Could you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you.
good afternoon everybody and thank you very much for uh, pulling me here in this uh, conference and i am very grateful for uh, inviting me and uh, i am shriram i am a lead technology evangelist from intel uh, for the asia pacific and japan region and we are working tirelessly on one api i am going to just introduce you with one api and couple of very good products that we have built around one api which can be demonstrated to you right now for next 15 20 minutes that's the time allocated to me and i am sure uh, you will find it interesting let's go ahead and uh, understand and learn what one api is i have shared my screen i hope the screen should be visible there yeah uh, one api is an industry initiative and intel product it is uh, so if you see the market right now uh, the growth in specialized workloads which means the demand for multiple varieties of data is increasing and specialized workload is increasing so to handle this you need separate programming language and tool chain for different architectures i have cpu i need to go with different program i have gpu i need to go with different program fpga again different there are multiple tools which are connected to this as well and the developers are forced to learn a lot of new things which is actually a pain point so intel comes up with something called as one api which is an industry initiative under intel product which actually converges the problems together and it gives you the solution it manages it helps you in programming in writing the code once and using it deploying it anywhere you have a cpu well go ahead and use it you have a gpu go ahead and use it you have an fpga no problem you can still use it normally cpu will be scalar gpu will be vector and the fpga will be spatial and we cater to all these needs and the programming language that we use here is dpc++ the dpc++ is nothing but a simple extension of whatever c++ you are already aware of but with mild improvements overall if you see one api is very easy to learn and it covers we have the optimized version of each of this say tensorflow the pytorch the python all these things are covered in the middleware and the framework and if you see this very closely here one api supports direct programming it also supports the api based programming when you talk about direct programming we got dpc++ coming into picture when you support api based programming it is all about getting the library support for you we got libraries supporting the math the threading dpc++ analytics deep neural network ml communication video processing and so many sir how do i learn this this is very very simple to learn and i will drop the links with you so oneapi.io that's the link that you can go ahead and learn we got specific compilers available with us we have got migration tools that's the best part of it you are already using cuda i want to migrate it to uh, one api i mean the dpc++ can we do it no you need not do it manually we have got a compatibility tool which which is going to migrate your existing cuda code into a dpc++ code 90% will be done automatically and 10% will be given guideline as and how do we do that we have got tools available for you to design debug and tune advisors are there gdb with intel distribution is there video profiler is there now this is the most important part that i would i would like to take about 2 minutes for you to understand intel has got multiple toolkits inside one api one is the base toolkit which is very fundamental it has got very uh, core set of high performance tools for building native applications that's like c c++ and all you got domain specific toolkit sir i am working on hpc what do i use we have got hpc toolkit sir i am working only on iot do i need to learn everything no you can come here and pick up one one api iot toolkit sir i am into augmented reality virtual reality what do i do you can go ahead and use our one api rendering toolkit sir i am into a analytics do we have a toolkit for that yes we have a analytics toolkit i am into deep learning where i want to deploy high performance inference and applications uh, from the edge to cloud can i have some support for that yes we have open vino toolkit now having said that i am going to show you a very simple and easy to understand demo which actually uh, reveals you the potential of what exactly one api can do for you one api is really powerful and very easy to learn that's the most important point that at the students level it will not be having so much of difficulty for you to come and learn this i can give you all those resources as well now i am going to show you one simple demo uh, which i have designed along with my team for retail stores and related stuff what do i mean by that when i walk into the retail industry uh, when i walk into the supermarket what happens is you normally tend to see that things are all misplaced misarranged so we have built a system which is going to be very handy for supporting this let me show you the demo of that and i'm sure you will like it i hope you can see the screen you can see the aerial is recognized right now and it's 99% accurately we are able to recognize and every time this is functioning fine irrespective of the shape irrespective of the container shape irrespective of the color we are able to recognize everything properly this is because of the extensive training that we have done and this is all real time and accurate
we can now test any product we can now identify any product like this and we have tested it for aerial we are going to go to the different color of aerial package also right now we have tested tide which you can see in the next set of demo as well we have tested pampers all these are working fine and i am definitely hopeful you will appreciate it here you can see that the color of aerial is different here i mean the package the color everything is different but still it works fine let us go to the next functionality this module will help us identify the empty slots as well as misplaced items. Once it is launched, it will perfectly tell you what are the components in the rack. For example, now tide is identified properly, irrespective of what color cover it has got, what packaging structure it has got, we are able to identify it accurately close to 100%. And you can see that misplaced is zero right now, empty slots is one. The empty slot one is nothing but the one free slot which is available on the left hand side of the rack and that shows that you can keep one more component there. I mean one more packet of Tide over there which can be sold. Now we purposefully misplace Pampers there. The moment you keep Pampers it is recognized accurately as Pampers and misplaced item has got Pampers listed into it which can let the storekeeper know that the items are getting misplaced and this can be replaced back into the previous place perfectly. Also, we can have one more packet of Tide to be kept there, which can help the customers to pick it up. Now, I am picking up Tide purposefully to see if the empty slots are updated properly. You can see the empty slot is one now, but still the misplaced remains the same. It is Pampers, which is misplaced into the Tide rack. All these are real time and we are able to achieve accuracy, which is very appreciable and we are always close to 100% accuracy. We are going to go with some more uh, testing here. I am lifting the Pampers now. Now the empty slots has got increased to two and we can keep two more packets of Tide here is the message that we are conveying the storekeeper. Now I'm going to lift one more to see if the count increases properly. The empty slots have become three right now, which is definitely appreciable. Now I'm going to do the final stuff where you can see that the count gets increased properly. I have taken all the four out and four slots are empty. This will definitely help us in arranging things in the rack properly as well as to avoid the items getting misplaced and misarranged in the supermarket. We are getting into the most exciting part of the product is AI based automatic billing. This can be done with ease and the demo would be most easy for you to understand and we are going ahead with the demo right now. The first product is kept which is Ariel and it is one product and the total cost is 100. We are keeping the next product for the same customer and it's tied and it's recognized properly and it's again one product, total is 150. Now I'm going to keep another tied to see if the tied number has been increased and cost also should be increased, which has happened as you can see in front of you. Let me keep another aerial and you could see that it's two in numbers right now and the cost also has increased. So this way we can definitely make sure that the customers need not wait for a longer time in the queue and this automated billing using AA has been completely used to make sure that the customers get seamless as well as perfect retailing experience. Well, we hope you like our demo. We believe that our... Um, so this has been completely done with the uh, capacity that the one API provides you. We have used open we know which is an inferencing uh, tool. So with that we have done the inferencing and the first part of it if you see is all the data is uh, received through the uh, cloud and we process the learning happens in the cloud and inferencing part happens in the open we know. So this all comes as part and parcel package within the one API. So I, I request you to explore that and if you need any help any suggestions inputs you can reach me out. Once again thank you very much for calling me to uh, deliver this keynote i thank all the organizers and over to you uh, organizers thank you hello hello thank you very much